All righty. Hello, everybody. I hope everybody can see and hear me. My name is Richard Jentsch. I'm here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And today we're going to look at some tips and tricks for Sarconia. We want to look at a safe approach um, to the final restoration, uh, concentrate a little bit on the framework design, nesting, uh, some post-processing, um, a little bit of infiltration or pre or staining. Um, but there is uh, more on that. That's such a big topic. There's uh, trainings available, etc. So we're going to just touch uh, slightly on that. Uh, sinterization, of course, and some post-processing after the sinterization. Okay, so the safe approach to the finished restoration is getting more and more important because we're with restorations um, growing steadily in size and, and having those all on four or all on six uh, or all on eight cases or whatever um, um, coming up more and more and getting popular. Um, the uh, amount of work will be put in labor rise uh, the material what we are uh, getting into this is getting uh, to a point where if something fails down the road in our processing chain then we are we're losing a lot of uh, time and money and labor and of course in materials so hopefully a couple of those things here are gonna help you uh, come into a to a more safe approach to the final restoration. Big portion of this safe approach is of course our processing chain and the, our precision chain where we want to start with a precise model from the beginning. Um, if you have a uh, bad foundation then of course it's, it's only going to lead to a bad end result and uh, the model is, is very important in, in this uh, uh, step, of course, as you know. Then with our scanners, uh, if you've seen the MAP600, we can now scan uh, with even an HD mode. So all those tolerances are getting smaller and smaller and um, we are then able to replicate them in our uh, production, in our CAM. And once all those different variables work together, hopefully, then we are being able to come to a good end result. Now, of course, you could, uh, since we are having a modular system, replace here and there certain things, and that's probably uh, the case in your laboratory. But with a full system from among their work, we could provide you the complete workflows from A to Z, including the programs, uh, for it and including the, the training for it. And uh, last but not least, you see it here on the right hand side, the material is an important aspect of this. And uh, looking at the uh, at the cost for the pucks uh, and where Amangirbak is in the price range, I, I think we have a very good um, material portfolio with a lot of good options for the different indications what we have out there. Uh, from a single crown, anterior, very aesthetic in the cubicle, up to the, the more strong, but still yet uh, aesthetic HT plus material, what you see here in the, in the pre-shade uh, on the right hand side of the slide, where we get the strength in order to make a full arch case out of that. Uh, the uh, um, precision of course, shouldn't stop in your design. And uh, not only on big cases, but also on smaller cases, like here, uh, a single crown, we always recommend the use of the virtual articulator um, and going through the different movements in order to, to come to a, a good uh, occlusion so that you can minimize your post-processing in the central state to, uh, just the minimum what, what is needed. Of course, there's always going to be a little bit touch up here and there, but uh, this will help you to, to save some, some labor on it. Of course, you could even transfer everything, as you can see here with the transfer stand, one-to-one -one from your articulator with the exact position, even including a face bow into our CAD software. Uh, if you have a larger case, that might make sense and uh, get even more precise results. So 
what, what should I look into um, here? The material selection is, of course, I already touched a little bit on that. It's, it's very important. And even on our portfolio, we have a low translucent, a high translucent, and a super high translucent material. They have uh, different um, strength values associated with them, and then therefore different indications are possible or not possible. So for example, our solid effects material, even in the, in the white, uh, it's approved for three unit bridges that includes the posterior, but you're limited to three unit bridges. Of course, there are, there are labs out there, I've seen cases where it was four units or maybe even five units with the solid effects. Um, but you always should be aware what the indication, contraindication of the materials, what you're using are. And the uh, uh, going away from the strength, of course, the translucency um, is another thing to look into, or the opacity, however you want to describe that. So on our low translucent material, um, there's still a need for that material in some cases. So let's say we have a very discolor, uh, discolor stump where we want to still come to an aesthetic result. Maybe the FX might not be the correct choice. Maybe there is an implant involved where we um, want to prevent that the metal is shining through. Of course, we could do some anodizing, but that also only helps to so and so much. The, uh, the other option, of course, would be having a framework out of a low translucent material where we then stack some porcelain on it in order to, to make it aesthetic. Um, the uh, framework design has a couple of things to, to be aware of. Uh, and there's a couple of tips and tricks I wanna show how you can come to a, to a better fitting restoration. The uh, CAM software, of course, and the nesting there's a couple of things to be aware of. Now that's fairly extensive in order to come up with uh, a rule for every single case, but uh, we're gonna have some tips and tricks on this. The, the white body uh, processing or the, the uncintered zirconia if you want. So there's uh, tool kits available, what you could look into where you already have to correct tools. The, the key here is of course to, to prevent uh, any vibration and to prevent any, any cracks before you even center it. The center cycle itself, um, as you might already know that has of course some uh, things to, to be aware of. Center end temperature is one thing. Um, cross contamination with maybe a low translucent to a, a high translucent or super high translucent material is something to keep in mind. And uh, the processing after sinterization is, is uh, fairly important, of course. And um, if you're stacking some porcelain on it, then you should know what kind of programs to, to use as well. And uh, in this presentation, I'm gonna, gonna help you out with at least uh, some of those. So uh, let's have a look at the framework design. On the framework design, uh, and this comes from our R&D here, uh, those pictures, what you can see on the right, this is a, um, a repeated, issue if something from the framework uh, didn't work out, uh, was fractured, and then folks sent that over uh, to uh, be analyzed from us, then on the very often found either the, uh, the uh, cross connection, the cross size of the connector, not to be uh, what we would like it to be or what the manual, even the material manual requires but also very often there are some sharp corners like you can see it here, which are unstable. So the idea is always to make round corners. Um, you get better strength from that. And those sharp corners are just um, prone to, to fracture. The same applies also with a die. So if you're looking at a preparation and you, you see very sharp uh, edges and corners on it, then maybe consider one of a couple of ways where I can show you how to, to prepare that for the restoration. Um, so let's have a look at the next slide here and what we can do. Of course, we could freeform our scan data. Um, we can also play with the uh, additional uh, spacing, axial or occlusal. And the... Uh, 
Um, favorite option for me is the brush instrument where I can add a additional zone in order to do that. So let's have a look really quick on, on how these work. So there's the free forming of the scan data. Of course, what you also could do is you could use a scan wax and you could block those areas out a little bit or you could use a regular wax and then spray it with a scan spray. And then you can, you have um, rounder corners. It's easier for the machine to process that. The sharp corners are being automatically blocked out from the software, but you can control it a little better if you uh, prepare that by, by hand. And sometimes you maybe want to block out uh, some extra on it. So let's have a look at the uh, next option here, the additional actual distance. You see right here, it actually software automatically blocked something out. That is uh, based of course on the tool compensation values, which and in our software are always there in the background, but there are different values for the different materials. So just be aware that there's a tool compensation in place um, and that maybe uh, there might be issues associated with making a design in zirconia and then trying to mill it in uh, a glass ceramic, for example. And the brush instrument, probably the best and quickest option where we can, uh, in the step of the cement gap, can select add additional zone, and then we can uh, make a block out right there. Okay, the, uh, the other thing, of course, for a secure milling are the margin parameters. We, we have some safe values uh, defined in our default. The, the rule of thumb here is to uh, uh, prevent a 90 degree corner since those are um, known to cause shipping, uh, chipping and the, uh, in the milling at least. And this angle here is gonna help to uh, prevent the chipping. For us, it's always a 0.2 or the first value here is always a 0.2. And then we are not utilizing the number four value. Uh, so you can, it's maybe tough to see, but you can see maybe it's on zero here. Uh, we have the angulation here set to 60 degree. You can play with that a little bit, but then uh, the closer you're coming to 90 degree, the more likely uh, it is uh, to, to chip. And that all then works together, of course, with your tool abrasion, with the type of tools you're using, et cetera. Um, and for us, of course, um, it's, it's fairly uh, simple and easy. I hope this can help out if uh, the, you would have some chipping on it and you're using uh, our materials and burrs and, and there's no question we, we know how they behave and we can give you some good recommendations on the help desk there as well. Then uh, here you can see the, the parameters of the mountain design a little bit uh, easier. So if you want to play it safe, um, keep that um, angulation on 60 and the horizontal in point two, of course. You can also add a, a color in order to stabilize things a little bit more, to give it some extra meat on the bone if you want so. So not even on, in, um, not only in metal, but also in ceramic, that might be still a good thing to, to do if, if it's uh, not in the aesthetic, aesthetic zone, then why not? There's something to, to hold the restoration on. You can surely make a good transition with your porcelain. You can also make a um, proximal saddle on here. And uh, that has the benefit, if you would do that on the mesial and distal, that you can actually do that where your contact points are. And thereby, if you have your settings dialed in pretty good, uh, you don't have to fiddle with your porcelain what you're stacking around there. Uh, you're protecting the mesial and distal um, portion of the restoration, so nothing would chip there. And if you get on the, on the heat map here, if we would open this up on the arrow, there's an option for contact points. 
and then we could see where our mesodistal contact points are and we could make sure that they are in full contour. And then it's a little easier to manage uh, rather than having to stack the porcelain on top of the whole thing. Okay, and then you could also uh, make a stress breaker. into the restoration, as you can see that here. Okay, uh, a little bit more for the bridge design and the connector design. If you go uh, away from the, uh, from the standard tab from your connectors and you go to free, there's a second tab in there. As soon as you move one of those dots, you get immediately here your cross section of the connector. So you see that we have 10.28 uh, uh, of a um, diameter here. And then you also see the height and the width of the connector. And, and those are really helpful in order to see if your connector is gonna be strong enough or not. If you consult the material um, manual, you normally get some recommendations in it. Um, in Zirconia, I would try to just make them as, as, as thick as possible without compromising too much on the aesthetics uh, there's nothing wrong with that and if you if you can in the posterior be somewhere about uh, 14 maybe 16 if you have the room do it why not it's just going to be a little bit more sturdy the uh, uh, if, if you somehow have a, a chance try to not be uh, below 12 um, square millimeter that'd be that'd be uh, fantastic then of course you wanna make those smooth as well. You don't wanna have any blunt transitions uh, into the minimum thickness. And uh, otherwise you just have a predetermined uh, breaking point on those. You can also look at those triangles here and you could use the subdivide triangle options. That's sometimes very helpful. Um, so if you, if you would hover here on those uh, smoothing or add remove buttons. You actually see what shift control and or shift and control dots in conjunction with a left mouse stick. And then if you're on the smoothing and hold control, that would actually subdivide the triangles. Let's have a look at the nesting. So this is a very well utilized block. Uh, but everything is, even though it looks very crowded and, and cramped, everything is well supported here. There's a, there's a lot of connectors in there and you might notice another thing, there's no pre-cut on those connectors. So of course that requires you at the end a little bit more work, but you could do something like that. The other option, what you could do, you see here is a little uh, island of material. Instead of connecting them uh, directly to, together, we could also connect them to this little island here and that interacts um, like a connector, like a little uh, connection node basically um, for it. That also would work. Uh, just make sure you have a fair amount of connectors uh, and that you have a good um, uh, diameter of the connector that you don't make them too thin. Sometimes playing with the diameter option here is, is good though, because then you can at least make a smaller connector somewhere um, than none, better than having none. Then, of course, there is um, a uh, magnification and shrinkage factor. I think that's meanwhile well known. We have um, in our software the option to immediately uh, enter a factor, a, a magnification factor, or a, a percentage for the shrinkage or the magnification, all the different options which are out there. We also offer help in case you wanted to use our material on a different system. It is normally then the magnification factor, what you're using, and then you would just add a, a one and move the comma over to the side. So this uh, V here is our magnification percentage, 22.74%. And that's the most likely to be converted into a um, factor by magnification factor in other systems, which if I add here a one and then move the 
the comma or two decimals over to the left, then that results in 1.2274 as a magnification factor. Of course, um, with our material, we have a 100% control of each um, blank. And uh, there's not just a batch control. We really check every blank individually. And uh, we, uh, we can guarantee that that's 100% uh, um, accurate results. Otherwise, the blank would not make it through the quality control. So if we go into post-processing, um, this is uh, how we recommend to, to cut those out. And let's say we are having that blank completely fully nested uh, with uh, all those restorations like we have seen it, where we didn't have a, a pre-cut made on this, then the recommendation is instead of just cutting through the connector to gradually reduce it. And we see that here. So it gradually reduces it um, by 50%. And then we can flip that over and then from the other side and just reduce all of your um, support pins by 50% and, and then uh, approach it from the other side and, and kind of um, approach it like a wheel, like you're tighten a wheel um, that you're always taking the opposite side and that you're basically having a random order of those sprues until you have all of them. Um, the reason being is if that 50% pre-cut from first to one side, we we basically have a predetermined breaking point here where um, if due to vibration, something would fracture, then hopefully it fractures right here rather than breaking something from your restoration off or causing stress would uh, maybe then after centerization, you might find a crack. Then the uh, finishing before centerization, uh, I think that's, that's something where everybody can put their own uh, fingerprints, their own signature onto the restoration and, and quality from the laboratory. Um, even though the milling results are coming out of the machine better and better, and with our HD, we can really make uh, outstanding things. You always have the restoration in your hand anyways, in order to smoothen over those um, connectors where the, the unit has been held in the blank. So whilst you're doing that, it's just, it's so quick and so easy to, to just give it a little bit more anatomy and, and bring the restoration to life, um, bring some structure on it uh, and some texture. So another thing um, when we're talking about touching things up is that uh, technicians you, you tend to like to use a disc. And that's okay if you know where you can do that and where you should not do that. Um, and uh, again, you want to make better round uh, transitions and not sharp edges on it. And uh, if you're doing that, then try to do this here in the green state, just because um, in the uh, in the sintered state, the chance that you're overheating the restoration, even if you're uh, using uh, water cooling, is just too too high because you're concentrating everything on that on that uh, one spot right there. So the uh, separation um, on the incisor or the vestibular or buckle, however, uh, that's all okay and it's allowed, but you should try to avoid any separation on the basal. Uh, just because of the way the, the forces, uh, uh, occlusal pressure is going to be applied when the, when the patient later uh, is chewing food, then this is really the area where everything comes down to the nitty gritty. If this is a nice rounded area, then there, there shouldn't be any concern. If you're separating that area with the disc, then you're just going to introduce a predetermined breaking point into this. Then of course, um, we are going over those connectors and we are going to clean the restoration well uh, with a brush and then with some compressed air. And then let's talk a little bit about the uh, uh, infiltration and the uh, uh, pre-center staining. I don't wanna to lose too much time on this, just because we have uh, webinars available, uh, online trainings, what we can offer, and or you could even come here for class. Normally, um, 
during the basic, the CAD CAM basic training, we always try to, to give you at least an overview of the different techniques and, and some hand, hands-on experiences. Uh, in a nutshell though, there's many different uh, colors out there. Um, what I can guarantee you is that of course, our color system works perfectly with our material. Um, if you are have already having a pre-center set in the lab, you might just have to try and, and see how that comes out. The, um, the reason why I'm trying to, to point towards our uh, pre-center coloring and uh, stains is that they uh, put a lot of effort and love into the development of those. There's two extra um, kits or two separate kits available, one more universal and one specifically for the cubicle zirconia, just because it, it, it needs something a little different than what the, the regular zirconias uh, need. And the, the whole color system is matching perfectly with our uh, solid effects multilayer uh, shades or with the pre-shades from uh, our HD plus material. And that might not be quite the case if you are using a third party. Um, the other thing that's a personal recommendation, uh, I personally have not used any acid-based liquids here just because they, they uh, end up uh, being an insulation of your furnace. Then that furnace never can be used for the, the water-based ones anymore. I don't really see the reason for the acid anymore. There's uh, many good uh, liquids water-based out there already. Uh, and ours is as well water and alcohol based. So that helps it a little bit to, to dry out a little quicker. And um, the, uh, the other thing is that the metal oxides which are used in that process, that they are, uh, there's only so and so many out there. So it's um, with many of the present of stains out there, it's, it may be a little bit hit or miss how well and how close you can come to your Vida shade. So for that reason, the recommendation on our, our liquid, just because we have all those things in place and we can tell you how you can accomplish the shade um, perfectly and every single time with our liquid. Um, the last thing which is applicable to uh, all pre stains, no matter who makes it, uh, be very cautious with uh, metal. So if you have brushes which have metal on them, then maybe put them aside, use them for something else and get a metal free brush. Uh, the reason is that if the metal oxidizes, you have a metal oxide uh, ultimately in your liquid, which is affecting uh, your, your outcome of the restoration. And uh, that's usually some either green or pink or something like that, uh, which, which is then the case. So if you're seeing that, maybe start with a fresh liquid and use metal-free brushes. The other thing would be sinterization then from here. And uh, there's, there's two types. You have the conventional sinterization and the speed sintering. The, uh, Speed centering here on the right with the two hour center cycle that still needs to cool down, but the cycle is done in uh, two hours, but that's only uh, available for single restorations. As soon as you have more than one unit, um, meaning more, more than a single unit, meaning a bridge, three unit, whatever, then you have to go back to the conventional centerization and uh, give it more time. We have some examples here for our furnace which um, you notice here probably fairly quick that all our center end temperatures, no matter where, are all on 1450 centigrade. That is because our material is completely centered uh, on 1450 as a high temperature. And you can, uh, you can take my word for it, or you can check with your uh, colleagues which are using our material that the uh, translucency doesn't suffer uh, from that temperature. Um, there is eventually, if you're going away from the center temperature, what the manufacturer came up with, you're running risk of, of uh, weakening the product. You're usually you're losing the uh, manufacturer's uh, warranty and you might actually 
uh, negatively affects and impact your, your shades if we're talking about a pre shaded or multi layer uh, zirconia. So, a little bit more to that here on the next couple of slides. Um, but uh, the other thing before we go into the temperature, etc., uh, I wanted to point out here the duration, of course. This is for single uh, restorations with only one hour of holding time, our standard program with two hours of holding time, and then here's our long term program with a, a little stop here at 900 and with a little change of the center uh, temperature per minute. And uh, our heat rate is here five and eight degree and the same program available with uh, pre-drying where we then heat up with three degree instead of five degree um, or eight degree like it is here um, to make sure that the restoration such as a all-in four, all-in six case is completely dry before reaching the high temperatures um, and give it some extra time to prevent stress and or fractures. And the speed cycle, you see that here with an hour holding time, but a 60 degree per minute uh, um, heat rate. And then from 900 on it's jerking. So looking at the uh, temperature a little bit more, um, I know pretty much everybody knows as, as soon as you're increasing the temperature, you're getting more translucency, but you get also very different uh, results um, with, your, with your gradient and your, your shade uh, results from the different temperatures. So it's, it's always crucial to, to make sure you're using the correct type of center temperature, wh whatever the manufacturer came up with. Um, otherwise you're just compromising uh, the, uh, the shade result. And you might get it too light, or, or um, yeah, that's likely if you're overheating that you're getting a too light restoration. Another thing um, is to, to uh, separate out your low translucent uh, restorations because uh, the, uh, the chances are fairly high that they have a higher aluminum oxide content in them, which uh, during the sinterization uh, will transfer into your sinter beads. And then even on the next couple of cycles, um, transfer back from the contaminated quote unquote sinter beads into your high translucent, super high translucent uh, zirconias. That's um, of course the case for us, but uh, uh, I'm saying that here because I know you're most likely using a mix of materials out there and uh, then maybe see which ones are the lower translucent ones and maybe center those together in a separate tray. It can go into the same uh, furnace in the same program as, as long as your center end temperature uh, matches with that and as long as the that, that you're picking the longest program for the biggest type restoration what you have in there meaning let's say you put a all in four case with the long longest program from us in there uh, including the pre-drying of course you can still put small bridges and single units in there but maybe separate the load translucent out in a separate tray while you stack and then uh, not only the shade but also the grain size and therefore your durability is, is going to be impacted if you're changing uh, the center temperature. And you can see that here that we are on the contrast ratio here on the center temperature is um, not much gain. So this is basically if this graph goes down, right, then we have less contrast or more translucency if you want. So there's not much happening on, on those temperatures where you would uh, sint or something and it. it's really all happening here and uh, therefore we think we, we picked a sweet spot and um, if you just increase that by 15 uh, by 50 degree to 1500 or maybe to 1530 you're actually not gaining all that much in translucency but what will happen is you're you're impacting your uh, shades with it like I already mentioned and of course you're impacting uh, your durability with it. Because if you're comparing here the grain size, this is not fully centered through here, of course, but uh, this is the most uh, uniform, I would say. Uh, we This one here is, is also quite good, but it uh, doesn't give us quite the results what we want yet with the aesthetics. But 
as soon as we're looking here at 15, 15, 50, or even 600, they're, they're getting uh, fairly uneven and so large that uh, it's just uh, impacting the strength quite a bit. And you see here on the flex flow strength, um, on the simple center temperature, uh, how, how that quickly drops and um, how that impacts it. Okay, let's go to the post-processing of the sintering. <clears throat> if uh, you would ever see something like uh, like this, that it lights up uh, your zirconia like this, then uh, there's there's definitely micro fractures uh, occurring here, and uh, you might even see an immediate fracture. Here we have one on the picture. Um, water cooling very low pressure on it and the correct grain size. So let me go back here. The recommendation is a, a 40 micron diamond grain and uh, uh, water, um, water cooling, of course. And that might not immediately show up. You might then see the crack once you uh, put your staining glaze on it only applied uh, slight pressure, like I said, um, make sure that your diamonds are not completely worn out. So switch them frequently. Um, and then going away from that, I also wanted to, once we're talking about putting some pulsing on it, I wanted to, to bring this one here up for the thermal expansion coefficient. The, uh, the tetragonal cubicle and, uh, well, the monoclinic zirconia doesn't really matter much because um, that's, uh, not, nothing that we really normally use much out there, but the cubicle and tetragonal is, is what's the common zirconia out there. And they uh, uh, eventually result in, in just a, a little bit different of a, a CTE. And the uh, porcelain range is somewhere, it's just interesting to see how, they're, how they differ. Um, the uh, uh, grain size here is another example. So on our effects on the on the cubicle um, and the uh, uh, HT plus is basically basically a mix out of the tetragonal and the the cubicle. Going away from from those, uh, we have also of course uh, those discs and uh, being able here to to post process everything after the centralization, polish those things. The uh, um, Pontic, I would only polish. Uh, you could also glaze over it, but I think polished is just fine. And um, very important is to polish the functional surfaces and your contact points. And the, the reason will come up here in, in just a, a short moment. And then having your functional surfaces here um, polished it has um, a very big impact on the abrasion behavior on uh, your antagonist enamel. And you see on the manual polished one, there is there is only a very small impact here uh, compared to a glazed unit. You know? And therefore, we it's not ideal to to uh, polish the whole units. It takes much longer than glazing. It doesn't have the same. It gets opal uh, from it. So uh, you get a more aesthetics if you're glazing over something. You, you can play with your stains, etc. Um, and you see though, it's um, actually then on, if more and more pressure is, is applied, it might even just crack. But it's not going to wear quite as much as a uh, veneering or a glazed uh, would do. So if you're, as long as your contact surfaces are, are polished before you're applying your glaze, or even in reverse, of course, you could do that and just um, glaze the unit and then uh, uh, polish over your, your contact points. Uh, that's okay, and contact surfaces. Then you're, you're being safe um, and having the least amount of impact towards your antagonist. There's another example on how that can impact uh, and, and uh, uh, how that would look under the electron microscope. 
and of course a smoother and extra sense um, a smoother surface is going to result in less wear and tear and then when you're uh, taking those to the heart and, and applying them on a day-to-day -day basis then the zirconia actually can be very gentle to the opposing um, the dentist of course also should do that so uh, we have that in our material uh, manuals and we have a separate dentist kit available and uh, the new kit is, is quite awesome uh, i can't wait to to show that to you going away for uh, the polishing and, and let's look at the separation one more time so we spoke about that earlier in the green state we were allowed to do that now here after the sintering we should no longer do that um, just because we are really focusing um, otherwise the, the heat on this on this disc on a very small area and that will um, most definitely lead to micro fractures or fractures a, a way around what you can do though is you can uh, put some shoulder porcelain um, uh, interdental and protect that with an, with an opaque uh, dentin give it a bake and then after that's done we are then being able to to use the disc but of course uh, be careful that you're not cutting all the way through the porcelain what you applied but then you're, you're able to to get a good uh, separation here as well then um, the firing of the porcelain uh, on it uh, is fairly important as well so i i don't know i'm coming from the help desk i don't know how, how often i've heard this um, question hey I, I went through all the different steps but then at the very end i, I had some cracks in it which is most of the of the time that the uh, program was too quick and uh, uh, therefore here are a couple of examples so this is a main firing for small units without major differences in dimension and uh, we see here this is the, the preheating this is the first temperature uh, the, the, um, the uh, um, uh, centigrade per minute heat rate and the uh, uh, 905 is the same temp temperature of the vacuum here and there's always two minutes of spray drying on there now a uh, compared from the 40 where we were coming from uh, with a slightly lower heat rate when uh, there are small bridges involved yeah? then you see also the uh, temperature here from 475 went up to 500 and also here to 500 okay going to medium size bridges you see the temperature the heat rate dropped again from 35 to 30 okay then next one for every additional pontic choose two degrees higher so you see that from 905 to 907 otherwise the program is the same and then for massive bridges you see we're here on 25 uh, centigrade per minute um, so that would be uh, like a bridge like this yeah and you see here the temperature is also increased to 910 okay then you're able to if you're following those guidelines to make cases like those um, which uh, of well-known key opinion leaders made here which look fantastic and amazing and then you, you can get uh, good results with your uh, system and your zirconia and